welcome to all present here today for the Change Maker 20 Summit, where visionaries and change agents unite to catalyze global transformation. Through collaboration and innovation, we mark, embark on a journey to address challenges, inspire action, and forge a path to a brighter tomorrow. Together, we shape the future we aspire to see. Distinguished guests and esteemed participants, I am Urvi Dhar. And with great pleasure, I introduce you to our esteemed speaker, Ms. Fiona McRaith, the manager and assistant to the CEO, Vizos Earth Fund. With a wealth of knowledge and experience, she has spent four years at the World Resources Institute, first in the city's team and then with the office of the president and CEO. Let's welcome Ms. Fiona McRaith, who will be enlightening us today with her captivating session on climate action and environmental sustainability. Get ready for an engaging and thought-provoking experience. Um, please take the stage and without further ado, let's commence this, uh, commence this invigorating exchange of ideas. Over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much uh, for that introduction. And I, I, I beat you to it a little, but that was very kind. And I'm looking forward to talking with you all today. So I was thinking about what I wanted to talk to you about today. And one of the things that we hear a lot is that we need systems change. And one of the things we don't talk about very much is what does that mean and what are the various roles that it takes to do that? So I put together a presentation on how do we debunk systems change, debunking systems change. And I'm Fiona McGrath. Again, I work at the Basis Earth Fund. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about the Basis Earth Fund and myself now um, before I get really into the, the depth of the presentation. So the Bezos Earth Fund was founded by Jeff Bezos in 2020 and is the largest philanthropic commitment ever to fight climate change and protect nature. It's a $10 billion fund that will be dispersed in grants by 2030, which is also the date by which the UN Sustainable Development Goals must be delivered. So we work across seven main areas, conserving and restoring nature, the future of food, environmental justice, monitoring data and accountability, which is a lot of satellite work, decarbonizing energy and industry, economics, finance and markets, and next technology. And this is a photo of myself along with some of our leadership uh, last year in Gabon, uh, which is in the Congo Basin in Africa. And we are doing a lot to expand protected areas and conserve this precious place. Um, and here we are with the minister from Gabon, Minister Lee White, but critically with a lot of our grantee partners who are working together to make that vision a reality. And a little bit about me and how I came to be in that photo. Um, I'll take us back to 2010 when I started high school. And this photo is actually from 2013. Um, I was in Washington and we were marching um, against a Keystone XL pipeline, which was a, a fossil fuel pipeline from Canada's tar sands that would bring energy and those fuels down into the United States. And we were asking President Obama to take climate into consideration. And ultimately, after a lot of work, that pipeline was canceled and a lot of banks pulled out. So my start really in high school, which I was in high school at this time, was in organizing and in peer education. And I worked with an organization called the Alliance for Climate Education. And I traveled around to other high schools, meeting with peers my own age, talking about global warming and contribu contributors to it and what we could do to help. And with time, I went to college. I went to McGill University in Montreal and I joined the Divest McGill movement. And this is us uh, st standing in solidarity. We had some colleagues inside that building behind us, which was the administration building, who were actually doing a sit-in. Um, they didn't leave for a week, so we were camping outside and we were calling for an end of investment of our endowment in fossil fuels. And also in college, I had the immense opportunity to intern for President Obama in the final summer of his administration. So this was in 2016. And that kind of helped evolve and transform my perception of what was possible. And the fact that there was absolute integrity and critical nature of having an outside strategy, grassroots strategy, but there was also critical value to having folks inside who were echoing that and sitting at tables and helping develop strategies. And I realized that I actually felt most authentic when I was um, working internally to create change. 
And it became kind of poetic because about five years later, I had the privilege of meeting President Obama in Glasgow at COP26. Um, and we talked so much about the role of youth and change makers and ways that those could be activated for, in support of climate, which is exactly what we'll be talking about today. Uh, fun little story, I also went to high school at the same school as President Obama's wife, Michelle, and that was one of the first things we talked about in this meeting, and it uh, sidetracked us for at least a few minutes. Um, but the real question is, where are we today, right? And where can we take all of our roles, myriad as they will be, to create change? And this chart is just showing you that emissions continue to climb from the 1990s onward. And the early 1990s are when some of the first protocols were put into place. 1992, um, there was Rio, and it was the first kind of climate summit, the first COP on climate. And even since then, and even with government commitments, we've still seen an exponential increase in emissions. And that needs to change. Um, this is a study from the World Resources Institute where I used to work. And from 2019, and again, this is pre-COVID, um, emissions have since risen. We still needed significant reductions, 43% reduction by 2030, 60% reduction by 2035, and 69 reduction by 2040 to keep 1.5 degrees Celsius within reach. And we are just simply way off track. This um, is showing our emissions pathways really dictate future warming and dictate what percent degrees Celsius we will, we will get to. So to just break this down a little bit, the green with the dotted line is consistent with 1.5 degrees Celsius, Celsius, which is widely agreed to be what we should be working towards. Um, I'll get to why in a few slides, but right now, if we took pledges and targets from countries at face value, you still would fall at, at 2.1 degrees C, and that is simply unacceptable. However, we currently, current policies in action are around an, an additional 2.5 to 2.9 degrees Celsius. And that is simply unacceptable. And one of the reasons why I do what I do and what so many of you are doing what you do. And just to place this in a little bit of context, things will be better if we keep it to 1.5 degrees Celsius. So substantially um, lower risks if we keep it there. And every degree of, uh, of a degree matters, right? So if we keep it to 1.6 or 1.7, that matters. And I'm gonna take you through a few reasons why um, based on research, again, from the World Resources Institute. So extreme heat. This is something that we've seen all over the world this summer, past summers. Um, for the past few years, it's been really, um, really prevalent. And at 1.5 degrees C, that becomes 14% um, more likely and 2.6 degrees percent worse if we hit 2, point, uh, 2 degrees Celsius. Again, sea, sea, I, uh, sorry, sea ice free Arctic in the summers. So that would happen once every 100 years. And with two degrees, that's happening one once every 10 years. And I'll just caveat that this research is from a couple of years ago and already this is being misproven because sea ice is so acting not in a predictable manner because of those positive feedback loops. Again, sea level rise is worse. Species loss for vertebrates, plants, and insects, two to three times worse at two degrees than 1.5 ecosystems, permafrost crop yields, these are all indicators that are telling us it will be worse. And that is why we need to fight very, very hard for 1.5. Um, and again, coral reefs, this is one that for me really hit home. We're seeing coral bleaching events across the world right now, across our ocean. Um, but at two degrees Celsius, that's a 99% chance that it will happen um, with dramatic declines. And 99%, for those of you who are scientists, is essentially saying 100%, right? Um, so it is imperative. And we need to change our systems, but we also need to recognize that our systems are interconnected. Um, this, this list that Change Lab, which the Basel Earth Fund is really proud to be a partner of. Um, and this outlines this 14 systems that are kind of, you can bucket everything under. So I'm just going to call out a few of these, you know, built environment, industry, power, finance, ocean management, freshwater, but many others. And all of these to get on track for that emission reductions by 2030, there are a few of these that we really need to focus on, but really all of these have transitions that need to happen. 
So a few that would be really crucial when you think about emissions reductions would be phasing out unabated coal and electricity generation. That We need to do that six times faster. We need to reduce the annual rate of deforestation 2.5 times faster. And I mean, you can read these. Uh, expand zero carbon sources in electricity generation six times faster. Increase EVs and passenger car sales five times faster. Lower consumption per person of meat, cows, goats, and sheep five times faster, especially in the Americas, Europe, and Oceania, where the meat consumption is much higher than the average person globally. And we need to scale up global climate finance more than 10 times faster. And that is one we hear over and over because it's so interconnected. Again, all of these are connected. And the critical shifts in each of these, the Systems Change Lab has done research and identified them. So you see in food, fresh water, ocean, land, power, transport industry, across all of these, there are a huge amount of transitions that need to be in systems. And that's one of the first things with systems change. You need to know what you're working towards, but you also need to know where you are and if you're on track and if you're on progress. Um, we are not currently on track. I don't know if you can read that, but in the green, none are on track. Many are off track and many are well off track and many are in the wrong direction. And that is why collaboration and making change and summits like this, the Changemaker 20 and the G20 and many other forums that you all are a part of and that we all can collectively work towards are so critical because we need to get back on track. And it is possible change is possible and there are a few different types of change so i'm going to spend a bit of time talking about these types of change because you've probably heard of them you probably work within them and i found this really helpful kind of framing for how i was thinking about change and systems change so you have incremental change so i'm going to take two examples waste and energy for waste incremental change would say let's just create less waste let's waste less um, and for energy, that would say, okay, let's be more efficient in our energy. Both of those are absolutely needed and very helpful, but that's an incremental type of change. Reform would be, okay, let's recycle our waste. Let's make it more circular. Um, for energy, that would be, let's promote renewable energy, but while continuing to use fossil fuels. So that's a low carbon form, reform. These are reforming the systems. A transformative change for waste would be cradle to cradle, truly no waste, truly circular. Um, and for transformation for energy would be abandoning fossil energy and using 100% renewables, zero carbon regime. And I would kind of loosely characterize for most things in the climate space, we've been incremental, leaning into reform for the past decades. And we now need to be squarely in the reform and leaning in and growing exponentially into the transformation. I mean, will you, with a snap of fingers, just remove all fossil fuel weight? energy no of course not but we need to envision that path and work backwards to the truly transformation and that will phase us out of the reform as well um and we need to do that super quickly as per those charts um but really the question is but how do you do this so if all of these transformations or these sectors are that guy on the motorbike delivering food or whatever it is delivering the change we need and where are the dogs running behind it we're barking we're running as fast as we can but we're still not catching up because that's an EV scooter, right? It's moving really, really fast. But what we need to do, we need some innovation and we need to get the dog on the scooter. And the way to do this, one of them among many is collaboration, innovation, and systems change. We need to enable systems change to get the dog on the bike. That's totally transformative, right? It hasn't been done. Of course, that's a metaphor, but it's a metaphor that tracks across so many things we need to do. And what that means is you need change makers. You need the right folks, the right technologies, the right um, energies, all within these different types of change, which all, all work together, kind of like a clock or a system to create the change. So you need strong institutions. You need leadership from change agents. You need innovations in technology, practices and approaches. You need behavior change and shifts in social norms. You need regulations and incentives. And also you need external exonus change. So that's like extreme weather events that we've seen this summer. You need something pushing the system to twirl together faster. And systems change has a trajectory. And this, there's a lot of research that's really beginning to come out here. But 
the emergence of a systems change, you start to see that bend on the curve. This is called an S curve. You can kind of see the S. And then suddenly you have diffusion, rapid exponential change, and then it kind of levels off in the reconfiguration stage where the world looks a lot different. And you almost think you can barely remember what was in the purple, right? Because it's so far away. And this can happen very quickly or very, very slowly. And in fact, we have examples here of when this has happened in the past, when our world has been transformed. So look at the purple one. This is refrigerators, right? So you know they they just got going and then all of a sudden they were near a hundred percent in certain markets home air conditioning cellular phones is a great example from you know the 1990s up until present exponential change right that is the s curve that's the green part of this chart um and again you see this with i mean landline phones is an interesting one it came up and then it went back down um electric power again and then it levels off um and you know we're seeing this happen with terawatt hours, for example. So you're starting to see all these projections. This is from the World Energy Outlook. The dotted lines are them changing their projections based on the on the data that is truly there. So that solid line is, is, is genuine data collected. And you see with time, they just begin to represent that S-curve in their projections as well. And that is transformation and that is systems change. And that takes a lot of investment and energy and change making. So another example is um, the price of lithium ion batteries. So these are critical to making renewable energy systems work. And you see that this is a exponential change the other way, which is what enables that true intersection of a curve. Again, you know, we see as well, we need rapid transformation in systems, but it is possible. So change is heading in the wrong direction, but we can also bring it down. And, you know, again, bringing this kind of incrementalism versus transformational change back to our minds, that typology, and, you know, transformational change can really affect a large, large scale total paradigm shift that disrupts the status, status quo. But we need to think about how to change smaller things and calibrate along the way, especially as it relates to equity. And this relates also to path dependency, which really helps explain how certain technologies and political and economic arrangements have emerged or persi persisted. So path dependence is basically when you walk the same way over and over. So eventually that path gets really worn and you're, you ha have a habit of going that way. It might, might seem like the most efficient or certainly the easiest. You're not having to move branches or sweep as much because your feet are doing it for you. But sometimes that's absolutely not the right path. You know, maybe there's something along that path that is trying to hurt you or, you know, harm you, or you, because you've worn that path so much, it's no longer bearing the right fruits. Um, I'm envisioning kind of a forest path here, obviously. Um, but you have these self-reinforcing mechanisms that help you do that. So sunk cost, vested interest, learning, and you need to transform. And we need to do this with our own pathways, our energy pathways, um, et cetera. And the quicker we do this, the least costly it is. So you see, um, to get to low carbon with time, it becomes more and more costly. So it behooves us to do this more quickly. And young folks and change makers will be critical to making that possible. We will need innovation. And innovation is a light bulb moment, right? And it's a new idea, a method or device or simply the introduction of something new. It could be that path disruption. It could be radical new collaboration, or it could be something that I can't even begin to think about. We need to imagine harder to innovate better. And to do this critically, you need deep relationships, a true commitment to people, because people are the change makers. And without people and collaboration and centering justice, it, we will never achieve what we need to, but we certainly can together. And I wanna leave you with just one last example. So this is New York, Fifth Avenue, which is a major, major street in New York for our, as long as New York's been a city. And this is it in, in, in 1900. And if you look closely, I know it's a black and white photograph from a time when photos were not high res, but you see these are horse-drawn buggies, a lot of people on the sidewalk, homes being built, etc. And then just 13 years later, this is Fifth Avenue, and I do not see one horse on this road. That's 13 years and 
the, the city, the city that never sleeps, the Big Apple was transformed with cars. Now we can do this as well. It's new technology, but it's that whole system working to make change. And that's exactly why we're all here today to talk about change making um, and how it can lead up to innovation and collaboration while centering people. Thank you so much. Again, I'm Fiona with the Basis Earth Fund. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I think we can have a conversation. Yeah, I see a question um, about, and we only have three minutes, I realize. Um, wait, I don't actually exactly know how much time we have. <laughs> Maybe uh, the organizers can kindly advise how much time we have left. Yeah, so thanks, thanks. I think uh, the way you explain system change is quite wonderful. And uh, that's, that's, uh, that's the, I think, uh, the need of the art. Because if you want to bring in something sustainable, systems uh, change is the only way out. Okay, but when we talk about system change, it also, the examples that we've seen, uh, it takes a long time. It takes a lot of patience. It takes a lot of commitment. Okay, uh, so now the people we're working with are youth, especially millennials, uh, who's, who don't even have the patience to now look at a complete script or a video, they now need 10 second videos. So how do we encourage, how do you see youth can participate in this when we talk about systems change? How can we make sure uh, there is a commitment from youth coming in there? There are many who are doing it, but with this generation coming in together, everyone needs very fast results. Okay? Otherwise, people really get bored very easily nowadays. So. The technology coming in, AI coming in, how do you think all these things can help where we bring in a commitment along with the patience that is needed to bring a system change? How can we create that ecosystem? That is such an excellent question. Um, so I, I think just as kind of those last couple slides um, indicated, I mean, change has been happening very quickly for a, a long time, but we've never had the same interconnectivity that the world has today, social media, short videos, the amount of content. And I think one of the things that I um, am be, that I think is beginning to happen as some of those young folks get older is we're seeing that those tools leveraged in different ways. So how do you distill the, the key points very quickly? How do you partner with um, different generations to both have the the two-way street of guidance as well. So, you know, there's so much that I learned from, from folks in my organization. I'm the youngest at the Bezos Earth Fund. And, you know, from, oh, we've done that many, many times, that didn't work, or maybe if we tried this, and I can say, well, what if, you know, we utilize and harness this technology to do that? And I think the question around attention spans is one that we will encounter for a very long time um, and actually could offer a window, a portal to how do we capture the essence of what we need. So in some ways, like distilling it down or something that we think about a lot is if you have an end goal, how do you work backwards from it? And those little bite-sized pieces of information could actually be steps along the way. So you kind of create this quick uh, domino effect uh, to create systems change. Um, but I think it, we're kind of living in this unique learning laboratory period of time where so much change is happening um, while the world's so interconnected and so much shared learning can happen that it's, it's like such an unknown. Um, but yeah. I see a comment from someone. Let's see. I'm 13 years old and how can we connect with me and be a change maker? So I think by joining this, I mean, we can all just collectively call ourselves change makers. Um, but I will certainly share my email. I think the organizers will share that as well. Um, I would be delighted to connect. I'm also on social media platforms and love engaging with folks there as well. So please feel free to reach out to me on, on Instagram or LinkedIn as well. Um, but I think how can we all become change makers? Um, one of the first ways I did it, I, I shared this briefly, was really being rooted in the place where I am. I think especially when you're young, there's, you know your local community, you run around the same streets, you, you eat uh, often in the same home or with the same people, you go to the same school, you're, you're very rooted. And sometimes, especially for me in young adulthood, 
the world becomes much bigger, but also, you know, much, much um, less community centered. So when you're young, I would think about what in your community can you do? Maybe it's helping launch a community garden. Maybe it's, you know, creating a petition for a new energy source or starting a club at school to talk about these issues with other change makers. Um, and then that will kind of grow itself into something much more as well. Um, let's see, I think it's important to bring the needed change. We need to be informed and have prior knowledge base. So how can we build a strong foundation to be able to be in a better position to contribute? That is a really good question. And I certainly am, am just one person commenting on this and welcome others maybe in the chat to share their recommendations to all of these questions too. Um, Cause you all found this in one sense or another from, from your own ways. Um, so building a strong foundation, I think um, it helps of course. I mean, social media is a really powerful tool for learning and for current events and for engagement with others and learning from others. Um, there are some brilliant books that uplift different perspectives as well. So um, one that I'm currently reading, it's on my bedside table, is called Braiding Sweetgrass. And it's all about indigenous forms of knowledge and how we can learn from them as we look to reconnect and protect our nature and our environment. Um, but I think beyond that, it's talking to people in your community, whether or not they're super engaged with this, but about this subject. And that will immediately kind of prompt you to learn all these other things. Um, about how you can best relate to them or also make change for them or support them in their learning journey. So for me, um, a lot of my family members have not naturally been interested in climate and environment. So in thinking about how do I share my passion with them, I've ended up learning a lot and distilling a lot of that information. Um, but again, please everyone pile into the chat and we can, we can get some other suggestions. Um, how can people in everyday life lessen their carbon footprint? Um, that's a great question. Um, I think it, a lot of it depends where you live um, because of the forms of energy that your government or energy provider has or what access you have to certain types of stores or cars or whatever. So I live in Washington, DC. A huge way that I cut my carbon footprint is um, my home is solar powered. I don't eat meat um, and I, I follow actually a plant-based diet, but in other parts of the world, um, there are just different types of ways that you can do that. So lessening carbon footprint might be taking public transportation. It might mean um, taking a ride share to work instead of driving your own car or perhaps getting a moped or, or um, I don't know, having a plant-based meal. Um, Let's see, uh, how do we drive the necessary compassion among the youth to take up the significant task of change? Um, that is an excellent, excellent question. And I'm seeing also we have lots of questions in the question tab. Sorry, I was missing those. Um, I am of the cons belief um, that every human and perhaps more than, more than most folks, young people have such amount a massive amounts of compassion um, and also like beautiful optimism uh, rooted in youngness and like being um, less kind of worn or informed by the world. You see possibilities across so many different places and I think compassion kind of abounds from that. And I think one of the, the things around compassion is um, kind of a shared trust. So I, I was co-hosting a podcast recently um, called Outrage and Optimism, and it's a brilliant podcast. And I was uh, invited to join them for three segments. And we asked one question. We asked, um, you know, so in the climate space, there are a lot of people who want to do things really, really quickly and just make change happen. And then there are also a lot of people who say, no, 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 we have to move slowly. We need to do this perfectly. We can't afford to mess up. You know, that would make things so much more inequitable or whatever. Um, and, or maybe would have catastrophic challenges down the line that we didn't foresee that if we had just thought about it, we would have anticipated. And I think one of, one of so we kind of asked ourselves, like, is this true? Um, how can we solve this if it is true? We had a bunch of experts on, um, including one who was a professional therapist, and he talked about ways that he helps people who see things very differently come together. And one of the ways was actually 
through increased compassion. And how do you actually increase compassion for people? You have to trust that they're increasing it for you as well. So I think the more that you can, that we can each show that through our actions, but also through the way we engage conversations with people, um, it will become this kind of positive feedback loop of compassion and trust that, and fun often is a great anchor for those types of things. Um, so, and again, I'd love a lot of people, you all probably have thought about how to build compassion in your communities and trust in your communities. So please jump into the chat. Um, I'm going to go to the questions tab. And again, I think our session ends maybe in eight minutes, but if anyone needs to come on and tell me that we're ending, <laughs> just let me know. Um, okay. Let's see. Let's, um, so Nali, let's see. Achieving lasting change often requires long-term strategies. How does the Basis Story Fund ensure that its initiatives have a sustained impact beyond the initial stages? That is a brilliant question. Um, so one of the ways we do this, and we're still on our learning journey as well, um, but one of the ways we do this is we think about how do we invest in ideas. And ideas might help achieve a long-term of, uh, of objective um, so or so 1.5 degrees c which i talked about a lot in my presentation is a long-term objective it's actually kind of short term but it's a few years off it's 2030 um but that's a goal what we invest in and support are ideas that help achieve that goal so kind of like what i was saying earlier is it's a domino effect we try to map out all the different things that need to happen or how this might play one role in doing that so in many ways we're setting it up and we also have different you know durations for our grants and different types of capacity support and different of course grant levels in terms of financing levels to support different projects but one of our main things in the initial process is talking to them about what happens when this grant ends you know what, what if they're hiring staff what happens who are their key partners and how will they build partnership are they thinking about phasing out at the very beginning um how does this build upon itself in future years um so definitely still learning on that but our belief our theory of change is that if you kind of plug into these systems transformations that need to happen they'll end up catalyzing other things to sustain their own impact or they'll naturally phase out when they're no longer kind of a needed input into that system. Another question, has anyone inspired you to, and motivated you to keep going during tough times when it feels change isn't happening quickly enough? Yes, yes, I've been reflecting on this a lot lately. Um, I kind of ebb and flow in, in this, in needing something a bit more tangible to motivate me or to inspire me. I'm naturally optimistic um, and hopeful, which I, I'm very glad for but um it certainly i mean it's it's it would i think just be impossible to work in this space or to like read news or to be on social media and not see these incredibly tragic terrible things that are happening with increased frequency um and devastation because of climate um so there are a few things that inspire me and motivate me um i have a the privilege of working alongside folks who uh, are endlessly ideating and thinking and change making and um, just the fact that that's happening is really inspiring to me. Um, the president and CEO who I work with every day, Dr. Andrew Steer of the Basis Earth Fund and he, I also worked with him at WRI, the World Resources Institute, He um, he's like and insanely optimistic. I don't know how he does it. So talking with him as well is something. So I would say communication and conversation are something that root me and inspire me. I also take time to walk in nature or sit in nature and just trust. Like when you sit and observe, there's so much um, life that always abounds, even from hard places. Um, but it's, it's really hard. Um, and also, I mean, there are so many inspiring people across every facet from the highest, most public places to the most private, most local places that are thinking about this, dreaming up change and believing in that change. And you only do that if you believe that it's possible. And that's really inspiring to me. Um, I see someone from the event team who might be telling me that we're out of time. <laughs> I'm just going to keep going. Um, okay, uh, let's see. 
What advice would I give would I give to young change makers who are determined to make positive impact but may feel overwhelmed by the magnitude of the challenges? Um, this I think is really linked to what I was just saying. Um, but I think I'm going to kind of lean into like maybe more tangibly what you could do. Um, I do think there's a lot of power in in centering oneself, which I do with mixed success. Um, but meditation or journaling or you know, quiet walks or runs or, or exercise is often a way of that. Um, again, I do that with mixed, mixed success. <laughs> um, but I think like tangibly, especially when it comes to careers or wanting to de dedicate your life to this, or at least a lot of your free time to this as a hobby or, or something. Um, I think thinking about the big challenge, the magnitude of the challenge, or if there's one that you're really focused on. So even if it's climate, even if it's climate change, that's a really big overwhelming challenge that I talked about in, in my, in my presentation. But when you, I encourage you to try and think about, okay, if this is what needs to happen by 2030, and there's a lot of publications on this, a lot of websites and organizations, um, this is what needs to happen by 2030. What, um, what what would need to be done by 2029 and 2028 and 2027 and 2026 and 25 and 24 and 23 and then you're standing where we are right now and you've asked yourself what needs to happen and one of the things that needs to happen um, is increasing good ideas and the probability of good ideas so say okay you know, by, by 2030, we want to have, you know, X percent decrease in emissions. That means that local solutions to expanding renewable energy need to be increased by that time. So maybe one way to do it now would be to look into what renewable energy organizations might be working in your city or in your town or in your country or at your university or high school or elementary school. Or one of the things is, you know, uh, we need to think more about how we have healthy alternatives to meat and that could be you know like truly alternative meats that could be increasing bean consumption etc so maybe it's thinking about how could i engage a school club to help our school introduce you know not introduce more meat even if it's widely accessible um and i think those small little things um slowly add up to positive impact and just a purpose can often drive um a, a feeling of like a purpose to create change is often a super empowering thing as well um okay i'm just scrolling the questions and invite any more and any others let's see so um sorry how does the fund identify and evaluate projects that align with its mission it's a great question. Um, so we have a growing team. We're hiring. Um, our website has our job positions and all of our grants and a lot more about how we view the world. Um, I encourage you to visit that as well. Um, but the the way that we do that is we think about these systems. So I talked a lot about systems and what needs to happen in systems transformation. And what we ask ourselves is what would not happen if philanthropy wasn't involved or if this didn't get funded now so kind of to also the question about you know thinking through what would we do right now we ask ourselves that with every grant we do and we say okay um we know we need to phase out fossil fuels what does philanthropy need to do about that the, you know most of that should be private government. but maybe philanthropy needs to invest in research around you know ways to develop small units, microgrids for small towns or neighborhoods. So who's doing that right now and how could we support them? Um, it might also be, okay, uh, a lot of it's research-based, but we, we, we truly assess and we talk to a lot of different partners and we say, what is not happening? Another example actually would be, um, I showed early on a photo of us in Gabon last summer. And all of those folks in that photo were doing really important work to protect and expand protected areas in the Congo Basin, which is one of the last remaining intact rainforests in the world and has a lot of embodied carbon under it and a lot of biodiversity. But all those groups weren't working together collectively to do that. And one of the things to help them do that 
is to provide funding to each of them to continue doing what they're doing, but additional funding to bring them together every year to hire additional staff to coordinate. And that can end up kind of creating change in a way that wouldn't have been possible without the ability to collaborate or maybe even sometimes like someone inviting them and creating the spaces to collaborate. So creating conversations like this. Um, but that is one way in which we really evaluate it. We ask, you know, is this right? Is this the right role for us to be playing? And is this something that's going to catalyze change? Um, again, to the earlier question about like an, the sustained impact, will it have sustained impact or will it contribute to a sustained impact? Um, cool. I think that I might be over time <laughs> and I don't see any more questions. Um, so I just want to thank everyone or I'm happy to stay on. I'm hoping someone can tell me if I should stay on. <laughs> thank you so much, everyone. It was such a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm really looking forward to staying in touch and congratulations on the Changemaker 20. Uh, this is such an honor to be here with you.